congregation, family and friends, I pray that all is well with you. Bereans, how are you today? You know, you may hear my, me sound a little nasally. Last night, the devil started attacking me, started attacking my system, trying to get me to stop talking, trying to take away my voice. But the Lord has given me enough strength that I can do this message today. The devil was not going to stop this message from going out. He doesn't want it going out. But I would just ask up front if you would just keep me in prayer because I know how my system feels and I know over the next few days it could be a rough ride for me. But be that as it may, please keep me in your prayers uh, that I don't get any sicker than what I already am. So, okay, we got our first troll that has to go by. Okay, troll, we got to say goodbye to you. Okay, they're starting already. You see, the devil didn't want this message going out, and already he's sending the trolls out to make life difficult. But we're going to talk about some things today. We're going to talk about things that God hates, things that God hates. Let me adjust this here for a moment. If you have your Bibles with you, or if you're taking notes, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 6 today. There's a list of things that God says that he hates. Now, there's many things that God hates. Most of all, he hates sin. He hates rebellion. He hates, uh, he, he hates lots of things. But here's what I want to talk to you about today. There are seven particular things that God mentions in Proverbs chapter 6 that he hates. And I'm going to start, I don't want to read all of them at once. I want to go through them each uh, by themselves. So we're going to start here. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. And we're going to be looking today at 16, 17, 18, and 19. Okay? Yes, he hates things like greed and lust and envy. Yes, he does. Here's what we have in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. It says this, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Now, I, first of all, we need to explain what this language is talking about. He says, there's six things I hate, but there's seven that's an abomination. Why would God do that? Why would he write it that way? Well, first of all, we see similar language in uh, Amos chapter 1 and Amos chapter 2, where he's talking about for three transgressions of Edom and for four. For three transgressions of Gaza and for four. In other words, it's a mode of speaking. It's, it's, a, it's a literary style to get someone's attention. Imagine if God just said to you or me, there are seven things that I hate. Okay, well, that's pretty impactful, isn't it? But suppose he said to us, like he's doing here, there are six things that I hate and seven are an abomination. Now we're getting like the double whammy. We're getting hit twice. There are six things he hates, and seven are an abomination. And it's, so it's poetic license. It's a style of writing. And so we don't want to be confused about how God is writing all of this. It's simply a mode of speaking. It's a way for God to get our attention. And believe me, he's getting our attention. We can read similar language in Job 5, Proverbs 30. If you want to look up those references, you'll see the same way. God will give one number, and then he'll escalate it by one number. And he's doing the same thing here with the word hate and abomination. Now, there are slight differences, but God, once again, before he goes into these things, he's trying to get our attention. Does he have your attention yet? Does he have my attention yet? Oh, he sure does. When I was reading through this passage, the first thing that, uh, that I do is I look to see, God, how, in what way are you speaking of me? In other words, when I was looking at these this list here, do any of these things apply to me and my life today, exactly as I'm living today? And that's the challenge and the question that I have for you too. As we go through these things, are any of these things currently in your life or in your mindset or in your heart or things that you are currently doing in your life where God is now going to say, I hate those things? They're an abomination to me, and you need to stop doing them. So let's go back and look at this again. Verse 16 of Proverbs 6. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Let's, let's talk about this. Just the same way we see number six and seven, six and seven, we also see the words hate and abomination. God is using the very similar technique. And, you know, we, we, can, we make a grave error if we try to pit the numbers against one another that one is more important than another. Don't do that. Don't pit it that 
six is okay, but seven is worse. I've actually seen a couple of people write about this. There are six things that God hates, but boy, that seventh one is really bad. That is not what God is saying here. And there's no real difference between hate and abomination. Hate is something that's intense. It's passionate dislike for something or someone. An abomination is causing disgust or hatred, something that's wicked, something that's vile. If we put all that together and we marry the six with the seven and we marry hate with abomination, God is talking about all the same thing. There are essentially seven things that are an abomination that God hates. And what he's trying to do is get our attention to say, do any of these apply to you? And I'm willing to bet if you are honest with yourself, as I am honest with myself and have to be when it comes to the word of God, then some of these things apply to us. And the challenge today that God is giving us is to get these things out of our life. Let's be honest. If God hates them, you and I as true believers should equally hate them. If God says it's an abomination, then it should be an abomination to you and to me. If we profess to be Christians and Jesus Christ is our role model and we want to follow him, then what God says he hates, we should hate. What God says an abomination should be an abomination to us. There should be no argument, no second thoughts about it. But now we need to actually start examining all of these and just see how many of these really apply to us. So let's move on. Verse 16, let's go back and get it in context. There are six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Here's the first one in verse 17. Haughty eyes. Now, some translations say a proud look or proud eyes. Essentially, haughty eyes have to do with a proud look. It's a prideful heart. It, it's, some, it's being focused on our looks, on outer appearance. It can also be uh, something to do with proud eyes, something to do with the tongue, a proud tongue. People in general, if we carry around pride, that's what haughtiness means. It means to be prideful. It means maybe to be looking down on other people, to think that we're better than someone else. Am I starting to talk to someone here? When we have haughty eyes, when we may be looking at someone else, who we think we're better than, or we're in a greater position in society. We have more going for us. We're nicer looking than someone else. All of these things play into the word pride. All of these things where we think better of ourselves than what we should. We have a proud look. Now, there's nothing wrong with us taking care of ourselves and looking the best we can. That in itself is not what God is talking about. It has to do with pride. It has to do with being proud. It has to do with elevating ourselves to a point where we're, we shouldn't be elevating ourselves. When we're focused on only that, this is one of the things that God hates. I think of Psalm 131, verse 1. Write it down or look it up later on when you're reviewing this study. The, the psalmist says, My heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. My heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. Let's take a lesson from that. We shouldn't be going around being proud, being so egotistical, thinking that we're better than someone else. We are all in the same boat. All of us, Romans 3 says, that we're all sinners. There is none that seeks after God. There is none who is righteous. No, not one. That, does, that means you and me. We're no better than anyone else. We are the same human race. Doesn't matter what the color of our skin is. There's one race. It's called the human race. And all of us are in the same condition when we're born. We're born into sin. And some of us come to truth in Jesus Christ, and some of us become saved, and some don't. But if we become saved, are we to look down on those who aren't? If God blesses us financially, are we to look down upon those that don't have any money? Do you see what I'm driving at? Haughty eyes. First thing God does not like. He hates it. It's an abomination. Oh, but he's just getting started here. The next one says, a lying tongue. Whoa. All of us, come on, all of us have been guilty at one time or other in our life 
of telling a lie. All of us. Lying tongue. What comes out? A lying tongue. Lying. Deceitfulness. When he's talking about this particular kind of lying tongue, because later on he talks about being a false witness, which is, which is a different kind of lying. When he's talking about a lying tongue, he's talking about in common, everyday conversation. We make things up. We embellish things. We simply say things that aren't true. It's really easy to blame the little brother when the lamp gets broken in mom's house. It's real easy to tell somebody something and we know it's a bald-faced lie, but we do it anyway. That's what a lying tongue is. It comes from habit. Lying has to do with speaking falsehoods, saying things that simply are not true, willingly intending to deceive. That's what a lying tongue is. Now, all of us, come on, I've lied in my life. I've lied in my life more than I care to admit. But do I go around all the time lying? Do you have that situation? Is it in your, is it in your personality right now? Is it in your, uh, your everyday routine and your life where you're going around lying? Well, you're going around saying things. Let me move this out of the way here in case that's in anyone's way. You go around lying, saying things that aren't true. Well, let me say this. This is something that God hates. It's an abomination to him when we go around lying. See, God hates lying. Why? Because he's a God of truth. And if he's a God of truth, then he cannot accept or like lying. What does lying get us? Where does lying get us? You know, there's an old thing. If you start lying... Then you have to lie again to cover up for the lie that you said in the first place. Isn't it better to always just tell the truth right up front? If you tell the truth, then you never have to think about what lie you had made up and what you need to cover up. There's no need to do that. Let me give you an example of a couple of people in the, in the Bible who lied and judgment fell upon them. You've heard me preach and teach on these two people before. You find them in Acts chapter 5. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. Remember what they did? They sold a piece of land, and instead of giving all of it to the apostles like everyone else was bringing all of their common things together and put it in one giant pot so that it could be distributed to those who needed it, to distribute to those that are poor and unfortunate. Why well, didn't I and Sapphira came up with something devious? We're going to sell this parcel, but we're going to hold some back for ourselves, and we're going to give the apostles what we want to give them, what's left after we keep what we want for ourselves. Well, they thought that was a pretty good plan, wasn't it? Until the Apostle Peter asked them, did you sell this parcel for so much money? And they said, oh, yes. Read about it, Acts chapter 5. Peter talks to Ananias, and then he says to him, why, why are you, you're not lying to men. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying to God. What happened to him? Instant death. Died. Hit the ground. Dead. They had to come and bury him. Three hours later, the Bible says his wife comes in not knowing what happened to him. Peter talks to her. He asks her the same similar question. She also covers up the fact that they didn't give all their money and they hoarded some back for themselves. What happened to her? Instant death. Hit the ground dead. Both of them were taken out and they were buried. Is lying worth it? Now, that is an extreme case. But is God getting our attention here? Is he starting to get our attention that God hates a lying tongue. Let me encourage you. If you're someone that lies regularly, if you're someone that this is part of your profile, this is part of what you do, God is saying that he hates it. We need to get rid of our lying tongues. Starting to get uncomfortable yet? He's not done. Here's number three. We go into the next phrase. It says here in verse 17, he says, haughty eyes is number one, a lying tongue is number two, three, hands that shed innocent blood. Whoa. Human blood he's talking about, of course. Having a murderous disposition. Remember uh, a couple of guys by the name of Cain and Abel? The second generation of human beings, the two boys, the two oldest boys from Adam and Eve. You remember what happened? Abel was murdered by his brother Cain. He was murdered over jealousy. 
He was murdered over the fact after each of them brought a sacrifice to the Lord and God accepted Abel's sacrifice and did not accept Cain's sacrifice. Well, Cain lured his brother, his older brother, out into the field, his, his younger brother, I should say. And what happened? He killed him. And then God came to him and he said, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Murderous intent, shedding innocent blood. That's what he's talking about. Abel did nothing to Cain, absolutely nothing to Cain to warrant this kind of death. We know from the Bible that God is a revenger of blood. God is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And ultimately, we need to let God, we have to stand before God and give an account for our life one day. Do you want on your resume when you stand before God that you shed innocent blood? Now, I am not talking about self-defense, someone breaks into your home. There's all kinds of morality issues. There's all kinds of ways we can go. What God is saying very clearly is you don't go around killing people. One of the Ten Commandments is what? Thou shalt not kill. And a better translation for the word kill is the word murder. Thou shalt not murder. Okay. I've been mad at people in my life, super mad. Did I ever get to the point where I wanted to murder them? No, thank goodness, that never crossed my mind. But how many times do we get so angry at someone? We start losing what little sense we have and we say, I'm gonna kill that person. I'm gonna murder that person. We shouldn't even let things like that pass our lips. We don't ever wanna be in a position where we have hands that shed innocent blood. I'm not talking about the death penalty. I'm not talking about anything like that. There are whole other issues. I'm simply talking about what God is talking about. Let me share this with you. If you're taking notes or if you have your Bible, turn with me over to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59. I want you to hear a verse, and we're going to refer to this a couple of times before I'm done today. In Isaiah 59, we read these words. Isaiah 59 verse 7 says this, Their feet run to evil. And they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. That's thoughts of sin. Devastation and destruction are in their highways. You start thinking about this. You start wanting to be a murderer. You start thinking these thoughts. And it says you're thinking thoughts of iniquity. You're already thinking thoughts of sin. And what's going to be your result? Devastation and destruction. Plenty of people in prison right now that I'm willing to venture to guess that if they had the choice to do it again, they would not have done what they did as far as murder goes. How many times do we do something in our life and then we instantly regret what we do? When it comes to murder, when it comes to killing someone, you can't bring that person back once you commit that act. And so God is saying there's something that he hates. And what he hates are hands that shed innocent blood. Why do you think he banned Cain? Why do you think he moved them on? And Cain was saying, I'm going to be a vagabond on the earth. And God put a mark of Cain upon him. Read that story. Cain lost everything because God hates a murderer. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. Now, don't forget what Isaiah said here because that's going to play into a couple more things. So that's number three. Starting to get a little more nervous here. Let's continue on. Verse 18. Here's the fourth thing of the seven that God hates. A heart that devises wicked plans. A heart that devises wicked plans. To contrive, to think up, to devise is to plan something. We all know about the heart, and we're going to look at a reference or two about the heart in a minute. He's talking about to... to to cultivate, to develop, to play and put together these wicked plans. And they all start from the heart. It has to start in the heart. It goes to the mind. And very often we wind up saying it. That's the formula. We think it in our hearts. It goes into our heads. And a lot of times we speak it. That's what he's talking about. Lying tongue, we saw already before. And now we see hands that shed innocent blood. And now he's talking about a heart that devises, actually comes up with something wicked, wicked plans, wicked thoughts, wicked actions. Is that you? 
Are you someone that has evil thoughts against God, against your fellow man? I'm not just talking about maybe unforgiveness. I'm talking about evil thoughts, thoughts for harm. You know, we, it's sinful thoughts that so bad they lead a man away from righteousness and away from holiness and away from a way that God tells us to live all the way over to the other side of darkness and evil and sin. We have over here, we have righteousness. We have the way God wants us to walk in holiness, in obedience, in love to one another. But these sinful thoughts, these heart, this heart that devises all these wicked plans takes us out of that realm all the way over here to wickedness and darkness and sin and committing horrible things. We know what the heart's all about. Jeremiah 17, 9 says what? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know who knows the heart? God knows our heart. We don't even sometimes know what our own hearts are. I'm going to move over here to Matthew chapter 15. I want to give you, and I've preached on this before, and I'm sure you've heard many, many sermons on this before about the heart. I know I've preached on it before. I want you to hear this, what he's talking about. In Matthew 15 verse 19, these are some things that come out of a heart. Matthew, it says here, Matthew 15 verse 19. Here's Jesus' own words. He says, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. Wow, that's just a partial list. These are the things that come out of a heart. And God, you notice how he's marrying some of these things already together. When he was talking about adulteries and slanderers and murderers. That plays into these things that God hates. And it has to do with a heart that devises these horrible, terrible things. That's what Jesus is talking about here. That's what God is talking about in these things. So, we have looked at four things so far. How uncomfortable are you right now? How convicting is this message to you right now? Because when I looked at it, oh my, I was looking at it and saying, Lord, am I really this? But how many of these things am I guilty of? How many of these things have I never confessed to you? How many times did I devise something in my heart or thought something bad about someone else or wanted to get revenge on someone else because my heart is desperately wicked? Because all of these things come out of the heart, adulteries and murders and bad language and all of these things. It all starts here in the heart. And so one of the things God says that he hates, that's an abomination, is a heart that devises wicked plans, wicked thoughts. You think something, it comes from the heart, and you just do it. That's an abomination. God hates it. We ready for the next one? We saw this in the Isaiah 59 verse 7 verse. This says here, next one, feet that run rapidly to evil. Feet that run rapidly to evil. Run rapidly or to be swift in running towards evil or towards mischief is what he's talking about. Those who do not abstain from temptation or tempted about something, instead of turning away from it, instead of shunning it, we run towards it. We fall right into that. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or sit or stand with the ungodly people. He turns away. She turns away from all of that. We're, we don't. God does not want us to have feet that runs towards evil, towards mischief, towards sin, towards all of those things that God hates. We're to walk away from it. When we give over to our lusts, and I know we all wrestle with different things. When we give into that, when we give into temptation, the devil, the door is wide open for Satan to come in and hit us at our weakest point. I've talked on this before. You know this. Wherever your weak point is, that's where Satan's going to get you. Wherever your weak point is, Satan is going to come in and get you because it's the easiest place that he can exploit you. It's the easiest place that he can take you over the edge, right into mischief, right into evil, right into sin, right into rebellion. And ultimately, it's rebellion against God. Ultimately, ultimately, we're sinning against God. We may sin against one another, but ultimately, we sin against God. And so we, we commit sins that are full of greediness, rage, different affections. We can't seem to stop from that. Remember Isaiah 59. 
I'm going to go back to this again. It's really important that we hear these words and we marry all this together because the Bible is one whole. The Bible fits all together. It says Isaiah 59 verse 7, their feet run to evil. Run. They're swift. Their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed innocent blood. We just looked at that. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. You're running towards evil. You're running towards towards temptation instead of away from temptation what's going to happen to you your thoughts are pure evil your 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 thoughts are filled with iniquity filled with sin and what's going to happen destruction and devastation are in your highways that's where you're heading for you want to go down the road of sin you want to go down that highway of sin instead of being in the highway to holiness as ezekiel tells us instead of being on the highway to holiness we are going to be on the highway right to sin destruction devastation there's a reason why god hates feet that run towards evil we're supposed to shun evil we're supposed to walk away from evil we're supposed to turn away from evil that's number five you ready for the next one here's number six Let's look at number six. A false witness who utters lies. Now we're back to lying again. This is the second time that God is talking about lying. This is a whole different kind of lying, as if there were different kinds of lying. Well, here's what it is. When we have normal lying that like we were talking before, just in our normal, common, everyday language, that we are just saying this line, saying that line. This is a whole different kind of lie. This is actually being a false witness. When, we, when it says here that a false witness who utters lies, we're actually uttering it, we're speaking it, we're talking about it, we're trying to say something positive here, we're uttering, we're breathing out is what he's talking about. This is the sin that he's talking about very specifically here, a bearing false witness against a neighbor, some other person, somebody who tells lies and you spread lies to purposely, maliciously damage someone else. It's also a violation of the ninth commandment, isn't it? Isn't what God is talking about here? Exodus 20, verse 16. Look it up. It's the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against their neighbors. How dare you and I make something up and slander someone else? Would you want that done to you? I've had it done to me. And no doubt I've done it to other people. You make something up. You say something that you think is true, maybe, and it's not true. Or you want to hurt that person. And so you start a rumor. You start saying things that aren't true. And it goes to the next person and the next person and the next person. Guess what happens after that? By the time it wraps back around to you, it is so embellished and so overblown, it had nothing to do with what you originally said. But that person's reputation that you started smearing could be ruined permanently. How many times do we hear sometimes on the news of somebody that said a lie about somebody else and they were charged for a false crime or there's people sitting in prison right now because somebody said something about them that wasn't true? And they knew it wasn't true. God hates a false witness that tells lies. Getting uncomfortable in here? If you've ever been in that situation where that's happened to you, you know the feeling when you hear something about yourself that you know is not true. And we're devastated. We want to find who started that rumor. Who said that about me? Well, think about the times that you did that to someone else. We need to repent of those sins. God hates that. It's an abomination. He hates it. Now we get to the last one. As if we're not devastated enough here with all of this that God is giving us, right? We got one more. He says here, one who spreads strife among brethren i've heard some people say well those first six are really bad but this seven one is really particularly bad as i explained earlier that's not how you understand this passage that's not what god was saying with six and seven but when we think about this this one is pretty bad what is he talking about one who spreads strife among brethren sowing discord among brethren other believers friends close relatives he's not talking about just strangers here it says one who spreads strife among brothers strife strife can also mean things like being angry having a bitter disagreement a conflict having dissension someone who is throwing the proverbial monkey wrench into a situation that's what he's talking about if you 
deliberately cause strife between brothers or between brethren. We see that, I, I see that in church. I've seen it in church for years. Sometimes us church people think, well, we really got it together. We're very holy and we're righteous and we honor God and we give our tithes and all these things. And yet we're the first one to say something bad or call others hypocrites or we start breaking off into factions. You ever been in a church where there's different cliques? You don't fit into this group over here because you don't look like them. That's a proud look, by the way. It's haughty eyes. You don't really fit in that group over there because maybe you don't have enough money or you don't have nice clothes or whatever the situation is. Maybe you're new to a church and they don't accept you right away. Anyone who sows strife among brethren, among family members. I grew up in a family. I, I, I don't like saying it, but I like being transparent. I grew up in a family that had a lot, a lot of animosity among the five of us. I have a brother and I have a sister. I'm the oldest of three. I don't necessarily get along and have a relationship with my brother and sister. And a lot of it was because of how we were raised and the discord and the strife and the conflict and the dissension that was put into our lives as we were growing up. I don't have to go into specifics. It's just the way that it, it, it happened. It's the way that we were raised and some of the experiences that happened, not only in our immediate family, but in our extended family. I come from a very dysfunctional family. Uh, I'm not ashamed to admit that. You probably do too. I don't know as many families at all don't have some dysfunction in them. But when I look at this and God's saying he hates those who have strife against brethren, those who stir up the pot, those who make trouble for other people, God doesn't like that. God hates that. It's an abomination. So lest that this message get too long, let's review this real quick. And I want you to be honest with yourself. You don't have to tell me on screen here. You don't have to respond at all. But my question to you and the question to myself is, do we see ourselves in any of these seven situations? So I'm going to read them off. And you have to deal, you and God have to deal with any of these seven issues are presently in your life and that you have to get seek repentance for. Number one, do you have a proud look or haughty eyes? Is that a problem? Is that you? How about a lying tongue? Is that you or is that me? How about hands that shed innocent blood? Have, have you even thought about doing that? Hopefully no one that I'm, that I'm talking to has ever murdered someone. But if you have, there's still forgiveness in the cross, of course. Do you have a heart that divides, divides wickedness? Do you have feet that run towards evil quickly, towards mischief, towards the bad things and not away? Is that you? Is that me? Have you ever been a false witness, witness who others lies against other people? Ho, ho, ho. Any hands raised? How about one? How about, uh, are you one that saw, sows discord among people? You caused, you know, raised the problems in your church or in your family or in your neighborhood or at your school or wherever the case may be. Are you walking in peace? Are you walking as Jesus walked? Or are you causing all kinds of issues? Well, I know this was a heavy message. It's been convicting me for a few days now. But I pray that this message has helped you. Maybe it's opened your eyes. Maybe it's caused you to look at some things in yourself that you didn't see before. You didn't notice. I pray that this message has blessed you in some way. If it has, please feel free to share it. God says in his word in Isaiah 55, 11, he says right here that my word will not return void. It will reach all those people he intended to reach. If it reached you today, if this ministered to you today, if this convicted you today, even if you're mad at me today, if it did something in you, then this message was meant for you. I only ask that you just share it with whoever you feel needs to hear it because God is not a liar and God's word does not return void. It reaches who it needs to reach at the time it goes out. I also encourage you to be a Berean. Acts 17, 11 says the Bereans were more noble than others. They weren't nicer looking. They didn't have haughty eyes. Here's what they did. They heard the apostle Paul preach to them. And then the Bible says in Acts 17, 11, they searched the scriptures. How often? Daily. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. 
I encourage you to do the same thing. Study through the Proverbs passage. Look at the other verses that I gave you in the other passages. Spend some time studying the Bible. Be diligent. Study to make sure that what you're hearing is true. There's a lot of bad teaching around. There's a lot of bad theology. There's a lot of things being said in the name of Jesus that just aren't true. You owe it to yourself to be a diligent daily Berean. Lastly, would you please pray for this ministry? Not only I said at the beginning, am I not feeling well? My throat right now is on fire, and I probably won't have a voice in about half an hour. But this message needed to go out, and I thank God for allowing me to do that. But would you please pray that I stay strong and healthy and on the front lines for Jesus, that I keep preaching boldly without fear of favor, fear of contradiction, and that I will stay on the front lines and not give the devil any due. God has called me to preach and teach the gospel. That is what I intend to do for the rest of my life. I've been doing it for 35 years. I'm going to continue doing it until the day he calls me home. That could be tomorrow. could be in another 50 years. Who knows? But please pray that I stay strong and that this ministry stays faithful to God. And lastly, if God would lead you to support us financially, the Lord knows. He knows we need it. He knows that we need it. There's no salary here. I don't give, This is a walk of faith. And we've been devastated over the past year uh, with losing a lot of our financial backing. And so if God would lead you to support this ministry, all that I ask that you do is get in touch with me and I can show you several different ways that you could help us financially. But even if not, I want you to come back every time we're on. Make sure your, your alert is on so that I can see you and we can work together and learn more about scripture together. I want to thank you for being with me. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. May God richly bless you.